Hello, and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg, and I am here to wrap up the reading month that was April and talk about my reading plans for the month of May, as much as I have them so far, and look ahead a little bit to June as well, just briefly. April was a really interesting reading month for me. It had a lot of fits and starts. There were bursts of really fast quality reading, and there were some projects that were taking a bit of a long time, some projects that got delayed until May. We'll talk about those a little bit later. And there were a couple of weeks where I really didn't get a lot of reading done. If you follow along on my Friday Reads videos, you know that I have mentioned that I've been suffering from headaches ever since I had COVID in January. And there have been a couple of days in a row in particular that really knocked me out and I did not get a lot of reading done. So it's been an interesting month because in some ways it's been really slow and a little bit painful. But in other ways, I've made a lot of progress. I finished seven books in the month of April, which is a really good total for me. I am someone who tends to read a little bit more slowly, a little bit more deliberately and make progress more slowly. So seven is a good number for me in a month. I know when I first started my booktube channel, I had some really high numbers in months. And then after I was on booktube for a while, I decided I wanted to push back a little bit and get back to the way I enjoy reading. It's a little bit slower, but it's the way I like to read. And that's kind of what I've been doing for most of the year. So seven is a really good number. And we'll go through the seven books briefly because I've already talked about all of them in Friday Reads videos in the month of April. So if you want more specifics, you can go back and look at my Friday Reads videos and you'll find a lot more about my opinions. But I will quickly run down what books I've read and what I thought of them. And then we'll talk about my May plans. The reason I want to briefly mention June is that since we are in May, I am already starting to work out what my pile of possibilities for Pride Month is going to be. I've already started planning in my head the pile of books that I want to choose from in print form and the pile of books that I want to choose from on audio because I'll be balancing both of those in the month of June. Because it is LGBTQ History Month, I will usually only read LGBTQ books in the month of June, either LGBTQ authors or subjects, everything like that. So it's something I really enjoy doing and this year is going to be no different. And I'm not really going to talk about what my pile of possibilities for Pride Month is yet, but I am thinking about it. So I'm putting it on your radar and I will probably be doing a video about what my pile of possibilities will look like very soon. So you can stay tuned for that. I don't like to call it a TBR. For some reason, pile of possibilities, which is a term I stole from that bookish bear on Instagram, feels a lot more friendly, a lot less pressure for me. And therefore, I really like it. So I don't like to call it a TBR. I like to call it a pile of possibilities. But with that, let's get into the books that I read in the month of April. A lot of these are either audiobooks or things I read in an e-galley. The first one is something I read an e-galley of, and that is Violets by Kyung Suk Shin and translated by Anton Hur. I have now read three books by Kyung Suk Shin, and I've enjoyed all of them. Violets is up there. I think Please Look After Mom is probably my favorite. And I think Violets sneaks in above The Court Dancer so far. She's an author I would really like to explore more. This was a really interesting book. I love that it plays with the meaning of its title in a lot of different ways and puts layers into what the book means. I thought that was very well done and very interesting. It is very much a book about a character who experiences something traumatic in the first chapter. In the first chapter, she experiences a rejection, and that rejection kind of follows her into her adult life. She's in her early 20s when the book picks up again, and she doesn't really know how to navigate the world. And it frames her journey and the decisions that she makes and the problems that she makes worse for herself in very interesting ways. She feels like a character who is at once kind of out of reach and a little difficult to understand, but at the same time, totally recognizable. And that is one of the strengths of Kyung Suk Shin in this book. It feels like this is a world that is very familiar, but it is also a world that feels tinged with not quite magic, but surrealism. And when I say surrealism, I don't mean 
like, like any kind of magical realism thing, I mean that it's a world that's very similar to ours, but disjointed enough that it feels off all the time. And one of the things I really liked about it as well is it portrays how easily you can be in a city, in a bustling area, surrounded by people, surrounded by activity, surrounded by constant change and businesses and all of those things, and still feel incredibly lonely. I thought that was really well done, and this is definitely a book that I would recommend to you if you have not read it already. The next thing that I read in the month of April was Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead. I listened to this on audio, something I had been meaning to read for a very long time. I feel like everybody knows what this book is at this point. It was shortlisted for the Booker Prize last year. It is currently shortlisted for the Women's Prize. I'll put my reaction video to the shortlist for the Women's Prize down below. I'm also going to put my Pulitzer Prize predictions on there because the Great Circle factors into both since it is on the shortlist for the Women's Prize. And it is something that would be eligible, I believe, for the Pulitzer Prize. I find it very interesting that the voting periods for both of those are, are happening at the same time. And I feel like if Maggie Shipstead ends up winning the Pulitzer, she's very unlikely to win the Women's Prize. And the Women's Prize will be announced later. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of that plays out, if she if even is really a factor for the Pulitzer. But... It's going to be interesting. I liked this book. There are two storylines. I thought one of them was definitely weaker than the other. That's the story that's more in the present day. And I ultimately came to be okay with it because it adds texture and flavor to the other storyline, which is set in the early 1900s, begins in Missoula, which is where I live. And I loved all of the detail about Missoula. It really felt like Maggie Ships that is someone who has been to Missoula, understands the geography and the area and the way the different neighborhoods play with each other. Not just somebody who said, well, here's a random town in Montana. I'm going to set my book there. It really felt like she understood the town. And I, I, I really enjoyed that. But anyway, it is about a woman who is obsessed with flight. And flight is in some ways a metaphor for her ability to control her own life. It's very subtly feminist story, sometimes not so subtly, sometimes subtly. Um, I did think there's an element of the ending that was a little awkwardly handled, but I really did overall enjoy the book. And I did think that the second storyline that I wasn't enjoying as much did end up adding something to the book so I can see why it was there and what it was doing all along. The next book that I finished in the month of April was also something that I listened to on audio. It's Black Cake by Charmaine Wilkerson. I was really loving this book for the first 60%, and I feel like when I say that it kind of dropped down a little bit in the last 40%, I feel like that makes it sound like really bad, awkward things happened in the last 40% of the book. I think what really happened is just that there were a lot of plot ends that were kind of fed to the reader in the first 60%, and the way Charmaine Wilkerson ties everything together does feel a little like a checklist, like, okay, this is done, and this is done, and this is done. And it's all really good, but that did make it lose a little bit of ground. I had thought it would be competitive for my top five books of the year so far. Don't think it will be, but I did really enjoy it, and I would recommend it. If you're unfamiliar, it's the story of a brother and sister who have become estranged. Their father died a few years earlier, and the sister did not come back for the funeral. Well, she did, but she chickened out before going into the funeral, and that's not a spoiler that is revealed very early on and they, cause they fight about it. Now the mother has died and she returns home to help settle the, the affairs and say goodbye. And the mother leaves behind audio tapes, talking to her children and revealing family secrets and details about her life that they did not know about. And I really liked the first 60% of the book. I just liked the next 40%. Overall, it was a really good reading experience, and I would recommend it if you have not read it already. Very interesting story. I love the way it incorporates food politics and food history into the story of a family and uses it as a sort of metaphor for family secrets that get revealed and the ways in which something you think to be true is not actually true or is a lot more complicated than it would outwardly seem. I thought that was very well done. and I look forward to seeing what Charmaine Wilkerson does in the future. The next book that I finished in the month of April is the first one that I actually have a physical copy of, Call Us What We Carry by Amanda Gorman. April is National Poetry Month, 
and I really wanted to try to get something in for National Poetry Month since I, it was looking very unlikely that I would get to participate in Aussie April, which seemed a lot more quiet this year than it has in the past. But still, since I wasn't going to be able to participate in that, I definitely wanted to get something that would check off a box on uh, National Poetry Month, and I ended up getting two. This also ticked a box on my Montana Book Company reading challenge for 2022. One of the prompts is to read a collection of poetry by a BIPOC author. And once I saw that prompt on there, I knew that this was the one that I was going to use to tick that box. Maybe it seems a little obvious, but I don't care. I like Amanda Gorman. She is the poet who read a poem at the inauguration of President Biden and set the world on fire. And this is the collection that came of that. I mostly liked it. I really struggle with poetry, but I mostly liked it. I'd say I, I, I 90 to 95% liked it. There are just a couple of situations where she really likes homonyms. And sometimes the wordplay feels a little bit forced. Sometimes I think she came up with an idea that was really great in concept and the execution felt a little bit forced, but I liked the majority of this book and would recommend it. And I'm really glad that I got something in for National Poetry Month, especially since poetry is something I struggle with and therefore I try to push myself with every now and then. The next book that I finished in the month of April was Infinite Country by Patricia Engel. This is a book I have a long, complicated history with because I started this book last year on audio and then I had to put it down because I was doing a round of the booktube prize. And I needed to make sure I had time to get all of the books in for the round. So I put the audiobook down, even though it's only small. The audiobook is four hours. So I put it down and I really wanted to get back to it. And I had decided that I really wanted to get back to it in print because I loved the writing of the book and wanted to be able to spend a little bit more time with it, digesting what Patricia Engel says in the book. And then I didn't get back to it. There's always a danger when I put something down intending to get back to it that I won't actually manage to pick it back up. And that happened for a year with this book. So in April, I was needing an audiobook and I was looking through all of the things that I had saved on Scribd or Scribd. I don't actually know how you pronounce it. I always say Scribd, but I don't know if that's correct. Anyway, I was looking through all of the books that I have saved and I came across the audio of this and I thought, you know, if I don't do the audio now, Odds are, I'm not going to get around to this book anytime soon, if at all. So I decided to pick the audio back up, start back at the beginning, and that is how I ultimately read this. Really glad I did. I loved this book. This is definitely hovering in my top five for the year so far. And I'm not going to say where, but yeah, it's definitely a contender for it. I'm really glad I read it. This is a story about immigration and borders and family and the gulfs that can separate us and the distances that are put between us and the distances we have to cross and boundaries of time and distance. It's a really interesting and sympathetic and empathetic story of the immigration debate in America. And I think a lot more humane than American Dirt by Janine Cummins, which is the one that seems to get all of the publicity in 2021, all for the wrong reasons too. And this is so much better. This I'd say is potentially another Pulitzer Prize contender. It's really hard to parse eligibility for the Pulitzer Prize. And I believe that this would qualify. It would be a great winner, potentially. And again, I'll put a link to my uh, predictions video in the description box down below. So you can check that out if you are curious. Then I had a really good reading day. My boss and I had set aside some time to work on something and then he got sick. So I had a lot of time to myself on this day and I started the audio of Time as a Mother by Ocean Vuong, which is his new poetry collection. I listened to it on audio, didn't love it, but I started it and finished it in the same day, which made me really happy. And then once I finished that book, I feel like I'm glossing over it. I liked it, didn't love it. It felt a little bit muddy, didn't quite know what the overall point of it was, but it was beautifully written. And then I started A Spindle Splintered by Alex E. Harrow, which is something that is on the Montana Book Company Reading Challenge. I need it to tick a box. It's not the type of book I would usually pick up, but I'm glad I read it because it's a clever book. It was a short book. I think the audio was maybe three and a half or four hours. And I finished that the same day. So I started and finished two books in the same day. And I was really proud of myself for that. And A Spindle Splintered has a sequel coming out, A Mirror Mended. I don't think I'm going to do the sequel 
But I'm really glad I did the first one because it got me out of my comfort zone. It's very like YA fantasy. It is a sort of queer retelling of Sleeping Beauty, but it's a meta retelling of Sleeping Beauty because the protagonist is aware of the stories of Sleeping Beauty and the different versions of Sleeping Beauty that exist in the world. And it puts a feminist spin on a fairy tale that many people consider to be the least feminist of all of the Disney movies, at least. And that part was really interesting. Like I said, I don't know that I would continue in the series, but it was really interesting and I'm glad I did it. That is the last book that I finished in the month of April. Let's talk about what I have continuing into the month of May, because that's a whole other conversation. I started Before Night Falls, which was the selection for the LGBTQ in translation read-along. I'm co-hosting this segment of it. This was the selection for April and May. It's by Ronaldo Arenas, and it is translated by Dolores M. Koch. I didn't make a whole lot of progress in this book. This is the thing that really suffered where once I put, um, whenever I put emphasis on uh, a print book, I would usually get a headache. <laughs> so I didn't make a whole lot of progress in the month of April. And now that I'm hoping I'm getting them under control, I will be making more progress in the month of May. I had wanted to get it done in April, but circumstances just did not really permit me to make a whole lot of progress. So I'm hoping that I can catch up in the month of May. The good news is it's a really chill read along. Then not a whole lot of emphasis is placed on getting through things quickly. So there are people who have uh, worked through most of this book, but I'm not really behind right now. So that's good to know. So this is something that I started in April and will be carrying into the month of May. And I look forward to finishing that. I had also started, well, I started the Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois back in January on audio. I talked about this in uh, not my most recent Friday Reads, but the one before that. I've been on a journey with this book because I started it on audio in January. And I was just taking forever. At the beginning of the year, for whatever reason, I was struggling with listening, not just audiobooks, but podcasts. So I wasn't really making a whole lot of progress but I thought the book was interesting and I got on the hold list at the library instead. It became available, so I picked it up and I started working my way through the book from the beginning. And what I found was I enjoyed the experience of reading the book, but I was going through it so slowly that it came to the point where it was due back at the library and I was only a quarter. It's a big book. It was, I was only a quarter of the way into it. So I thought about it and what I came to as a sort of realization was that I really liked the ability to work my way through it slowly because there's a lot of detail. Uh, Honoré Fanon Jeffers refers to it as a kitchen table epic about ancestry, but centering on uh, a, a teenage black girl, at least in the part where I am, who is, and her ties to the ancestral land. The, there's a second storyline that is sort of working through the ancestral stories that lead to her life. And then she starts out at age four and she is in college at the point where I was in the book when I had to return it to the library. There's a lot of detail in it. And to me, it all really pays off. It's delicious and well thought out and very sumptuous. And Honoré Fernand Jeffers is a poet and she's a beautiful writer. So I really wanted to be able to enjoy that slow reading approach to it. So I looked and it turns out it's coming out in paperback on May 10th, which I think is a gamble on the part of the publisher because the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction is announced on May 9th. So it seems they're really gambling that it's going to win. This is my prediction for the Pulitzer Prize. It's a lot of other people's prediction for the Pulitzer Prize this year. It'll be interesting to see if it wins or not. But anyway, point is the paperback is coming out. So I called Montana Book Company and pre-ordered a copy of the paperback, and then I returned it to the library. So I'm kind of in limbo with this book again. So in May, the two things I really definitely need to do are Before Night Falls and The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, because once I get it in paperback, I'm gonna pick up and do my slow reading approach to it again. Everything else if I, that I finish in the month of May is gonna be a bonus on top of that. But let's talk about what my options are. The other selection for the LGBTQ in translation read-along was Disoriental by Nagar Javadi, translated by, it's not on the cover, but I don't want to overlook it, uh, translated by, from the French by Tina Cover. 
So Before Night Falls was the official selection. This was the other option. I did want to read both. And I peeked last night, and there is an audiobook of this available. So I think instead of reading the print book, I'm probably going to try to get this in on audio in the month of May. And then I will have my LGBTQ in translation read-along work done for April and May. And that will be absolutely lovely. Looking at other options for the month of May, I have access to three different e-galleys for books that are publishing in the month of June. And I would really like to read them before they are published. And they are Solo Dance by Lee Katomi, translated by Arthur Reggie Morris, The Kingdom of Sand by Andrew Holleran, which is published on June 7th, and Woman of Light by Callie Fajardo Anstein, which is also published on June 7th. So if I can work my way through Before Night Falls, Disoriental, and The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, I would love to start digging on those. I may balance some of them with love songs since I'm taking a slow approach. By the way, I forgot a book that I'm currently reading that carried over into May, so let me talk about it now. It's Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing by Lauren Huff. I'm listening to this on audio. Lauren Huff is sort of a complicated figure right now because she had a whole thing on Twitter last year. I'm not really going to get into it right now. But this was recommended to me by Charlie from the Montana Book Company. It fits a prompt for the Montana Book Company Reading Challenge for 2022. So I'm reading it with the awareness that there was that whole thing last year. And so far, I admit I'm liking it. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm not that far in. I think I'm 25% of the way into the book. And it'll be interesting to see what happens as I finish it now that we are in the month of May. So my May plans are finish... Uh, leaving isn't the hardest thing. And then I might turn to Disoriental on audio. And then where I go on audio from there, I don't know. But in print, I need to finish Before Night Falls. And then hopefully I'll have that done in time for the Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois to be released in paperback. And then I'll probably mix in one of those three e-galleys in at least as I work through the rest of the Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. And then we'll be into June. I think that's probably enough of a plan for the month of May. But I would love to hear what you read in April, what you loved, what you hated, what you have on your plate for May. And if you will be participating in Pride Month reading in the month of June. Let me know all of that in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time. And I will be back until next time. Happy reading.